Good morning. This is Christopher Donahue speaking. I'm honored to introduce Professor Jaipreet Virdi. Professor Virdi is an award-winning historian whose research focuses on the ways medicine and technology impact the lived experiences of disabled people. Her first book, Hearing Happiness, Deaf Cures and History, raises pivotal questions about deafness in American society and the endless or seemingly endless quest for a cure. She has published articles on diagnostic technologies, audio, audiometry, hearing aids, and the medicalization of deafness, and has published essays in The Atlantic, Slate Future Tense, and The New Internationalist, as well as The Washington Post. Professor Vierdi has taught at Ryerson University, the University of Toronto, and Brock University. She is currently an associate professor at the Department of History at the University of Delaware, where she teaches courses on disability histories, the history of medicine, and health activism. She also currently serves as the co-director of the Hagley Program in the History of Capitalism technology, and culture. She is currently working on multiple projects. Her second book, Medicalizing Deafness, Oral Surgery in 19th Century Britain, traces the efforts of British aurists or ear specialists, examining how their attempts to define a professional identity influenced educational, progressive, and eugenicist programs to eradicate deafness. You can follow her at Jai Virdi on Twitter. Professor Virdi's talk will be about 40 minutes long and will be followed by about a 15 minute question and answer session. Thank you again, Professor Virdi, and we look forward to the discussion after, to your keynote and to the discussion afterwards. Now over to you, Professor Virdi. Good morning. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm very pleased to deliver this keynote and want to thank Dr. Donahue for the invitation and the introduction, and also to the interpreters and captioners for their work today. We'll begin with my sharing my screen. On the screen is an, the title slide for my talk, titled Measuring the Science of Hereditary Deafness. And behind the text, there is an illustration of a Mendelian chart showing a deaf and hearing family. The topic of this symposium on disability and genomics asks us to think deeply about the entangled roots of ableism within science and medicine, both historically and in our present day clinical encounters. The topic I find also prompts us to consider questions about authority. Whose authority matters within healthcare, whether in the laboratory, in clinical space? And how does authority shape or is shaped by accounts of ableism? These are questions that I'm addressing in my current big project, provisionally titled Medicalizing Deafness. I will be sharing aspects of this project today namely on how increasing statistical study on deafness and ear diseases in the 19th century presented worrying data about hereditary deafness, thus sparking greater medical and state intervention at the site of these concerns, deaf schools. The slide says, Introduction, a crisis of care. There is a beige graphic on the right. To contextualize this history, I want to begin by briefly sharing an end code about a crisis of care or the challenger of what historians refer to as the silence of the archive, or more specifically, the difficulties of encountering deaf and disabled perspectives in the archive that are not presented through an auditory standpoint. As a historian of medicine, science, and technology, my approach to writing deaf history tends to be filtered through the perception of those who are engaging with medical care and knowledge, namely the practitioners who specialize in deafness and ear diseases, 
in the 19th century who refer to themselves as Oris or Orisodre, and by the end of the 19th century as Autologous. While they predominantly approach their people as subjects for developing theories on disease causation and hearing loss, some of these present trainers additionally considered access to language and education as essential as medical care for a deaf person's overall well-being. As a result, the extent of the reach beyond the clinical space to schools of the deaf. Centering disability history, however, my research also considers how deaf people and the concept of deafness, both in its suppression and active resistance to intervention, had shaped the ways all surgeons thought about their roles as medical experts within the various institutional roles that they crafted for themselves. There is now a graphic um, on the right. It is an illustration of a 19th century institution surrounded by trees. The text below the script says, Asylum for the Deaf and Dumb. Beginning in 2009, when I first embarked on this project as part of my doctoral dissertation, I was focusing on the institutional and medical history of the London Asylum for the Deaf and Dumb. Initially founded in 1792 at the Asylum for the Support and Education of the Deaf and Dumb Children of the Poor, this was the first public school providing education and training to deaf children in the United Kingdom eventually expanding and relocating several times before being settled in the 20th century as the Royal School for Deaf Children in Margaret, Kent. Correspondence with the administration at the school revealed that there were archival materials available for researchers like myself, some of which dated to the school's founding in 1792. I was certainly overjoyed but repeated requests to ask that these materials went unacknowledged, if not completely rejected. After reaching out to members of the British Deaf History Society who had previously asked us the material and helped in its organization, I learned that the materials of the school were not maintained in any fashion adhering to archival standards. Boxes were essentially dumped in a trailer, some of which accounted serious water damage. I spent the next five years requesting to view the material and not even a letter of introduction from the president of the British Deaf History Society would grant me access. So reluctantly, I moved on from this project. On the screen, there is now an article titled UK's Oldest Deaf School Closes Amid Concern Children Are Being Let Down. Below, there is a photo of a classroom and a teacher is assisting two children who are at work. The children are wearing cochlear implants. Meanwhile, in 2016, after 224 years of service, the Royal School permanently closed when the John Townsend Trust went into administration after decades of neglect and mismanagement and following reports of a long-standing history of physical abuse against their pupils. Some records as late as 2014 testified that multiple people reported staff marking them for being unable to hear and even physically restraining them to ensure that these children um, avoided signing. The archive was initially lost, but then recovered and now are maintained by the Kent County Council. While I, while I have thus been able to restart my research, the unfortunate closing of the Royal School captured broader cultural shifts about the place of deaf people within British society and the legacy of medical intervention within educational spaces. Deafness is classified as the second most common disability in the United Kingdom, with approximately 11 million people diagnosed with hearing loss, 900,000 of whom are severely or profoundly deaf and communicate largely with British Sign Language. Yet deaf people report significant barriers to education, employment, and access to health services. 
at least 40% of deaf people and even more who are signers report mental health issues brought on by barriers in social and welfare services and their struggle with accessing proper health care. One study revealed that 77% of deaf people with primary language and British Sign Language have difficulty communicating with the doctor and at least 30% avoid the doctor altogether out of fear or frustration. Not even the passing of the Quality Act in 2010, which limits disability as one of the nine protected characters, characteristics against discrimination, has reduced misconception and assumption about deaf people and the problem of accessing health services, including addressing the discrimination accounted through communication difficulties. On the screen is an illustration of a male physician examining a child's ear. The child is held by his mother. Below is the text title, Medicalizing Deafness, also due in 19th century Britain, and summary points for what is being spoken. In my book manuscript, I argue the roots of the crisis of communication and care can be traced to arguments by 19th century British all children who claimed that education and medicine would produce self-sufficient deaf citizens who would otherwise be lost to perpetual silence. Their perspective held stuck fast through the start of the 20th century when nativist and eugenist concern about the cost of treating and caring for, quote, degenerate or deficient people significantly shaped discourses about education. Checking out what historian Mark Jackson defined as the medical pedagogical approach, all surgeons secure their authority by extending the vo their role outside of the clinic and more crucially, by offering intellectual respectability for translating statistical data into social policy. So my talk centers on this very broad history, but focusing on one specific concern, and that is how increasing worries about hereditary deafness in the late 19th century began to be shaped by statistics and eugenics, therefore transforming the tenets of deaf education. As we shall see, concerns about hereditary deafness were by no means standard nor universally agreed upon, but the alarmist rhetoric was powerful and worrying, thus shaping the lives of deaf people for generations to come. The text on the screen says statistical authority. The professional expansion of all surgery and the authority of ours occurred within the broader context of Victorian optimism about the application of scientific medicine to, avoid, to solve a range of social problems. The optimism appeared self-evident in a society rife with perceptions of imperialism in the applied sciences and in which expectation of progress required new and promising scientific strategy for understanding the social calculus. In other words, social problems became issues for statistical analysis. Of course, while discourses on the applications of statistics for more and social reform were by no means homogeneous, numbers, graphs, and formulas possessed immense rhetorical power especially when enhanced by bureaucratic management. On the screen is a table of different diseases of the ear as treated and recorded at St. Mark's Hospital in Dublin. All surgeons had long compiled narrative case studies of the patients and maintain records within hospital annual reports. The data lend support for how they assess the prevalence of deaf population and how they interpreted and categorized ear diseases. 
especially hereditary debt mutism, which they found very difficult to treat, let alone cure. British educators of the deaf as well maintain records of their pupil health status, including details about probable or actual causes of deafness, the race of hereditary deafness, and the presence of deaf mute people in a given population. Congenital deaf mute people with generations of hereditary deafness, especially through deaf intermarriage, which is marriage between deaf persons, fell at the center of these eugenic debates. Autologists and oralists alike raised several questions. Was hereditary deaf mutism a single variation easily transmitted through deaf families who intermarry? Was congenital deafness a hereditary trait? Was marriages between hereditary deaf and hearing partners further spreading deafness and therefore polluting, quote, the national stock? The text is statistical authority. There is a beige graphic on the right with text overlaid summarizing the points that are being spoken. It is at this juncture that hereditary deafness became a pressing issue as notions of prevention and medical surveillance became intertwined with eugenic, eugenicist ideology. Largely perceived as an ideology of the professional middle class, but also attracting attention from scientists, policymakers, and social reformers from across the political spectrum. Eugenics was held as a solution to the problems of the British society. Urbanization, disease, pauperism, more degradation, and it also functioned as a tool for augmenting class, gender, and race-based division. Eugenics offered intellectual respectability because it allowed Prakashina to translate scientific data about heredity into social policy, especially to quell broader evolutionary debates about human nature and to reduce the cost of treating and caring for a quote, degenerate population. While evidential findings of degeneration tended to be anticodal rather than statistical, fears of degeneration nevertheless influenced public health policy and legislative reform. There is now a table showing a selection of large families with generational deafness and the propensity of generation in which a deaf child was produced. Between 1890 and 1930, eugenics policies began to take root across deaf institutions. All of them, the pedagogy of speech rather than sign, was presented as a way to give teachers the responsibility and ability to instill spoken language in deaf people, returning them to human society and thus human evolution. Indeed, as one medical practitioner asserted, the issue of teaching deaf children speech was, quote, so largely a social and eugenic one. Eugenics then was presented as a method for providing deaf children with respectability, literacy, and mannerism as manifested for social mobility especially when supported by state provision. Education was precision at the site where different experts could meet to apply eugenicist idea for tackling concerns of deaf inherent, a point stressed by one instructor. Quote, education is the only remedy that can in any way mitigate the ill which mankind are liable to transmit to their descendant. And the quote is also up on the screen. This eugenic impulse to stratify deaf children through questions of heredity 
was thereby part of a larger process of normalizing and standardizing deaf education and try to progressive goal of health and prevention. That is, the ultimate goal was to reduce, if not eliminate, the risk of hereditary deaf mutism, quote, spreading unchecked to the population. While British artists were entangled with issues of deaf education throughout the 19th century, the level of their engagement began to steadily increase in the 1880s as they faced greater responsibility for protecting the health and welfare of deaf school children, including through early prevention programs to halt progressive deafness. On the, on the screen are text summarizing the key events which I will be speaking. Several key events occurred in the late 19th century that would drastically transform Irish role in deaf education. First was the Second International Congress on the De Education of the Deaf that took place in Milan in September 1880. A multi-day, a multinational event drawing 164 educators, physicians, and laypersons, which was also dominated by Italy and France, bringing a combined 143 delegates. The discussion at this Congress exclusively focused on the issue of methods of instruction for educating deaf children. Only one deaf delegate attended, as the convention was mainly managed by promoters of oralism. At the end, the convention passed eight resolutions declaring, quote, the uncontemptible superiority of speech over sign in restoring the deaf mute to society and giving him a more perfect knowledge of language. The delegates proclaim that the oral method are to be the preferred, sorry, the oral method are to be preferred to that of sign for the education and instruction of deaf children. By no means, however, was the resolution universal, nor did it completely eradicate sign language. In fact, many British schools continued with the combined system of speech and sign well into the 20th century. The second key event was the results of several surveys undertaken by headmasters at deaf school, as well as charitable societies, to assess the social problem of deafness and blindness with the aim of formulating social policies. The surveys provided essential data for pursuing state action especially when it coupled with the 1861 census, which revealed the inadequacy of educational fertility for blind and deaf children. <coughs> Third, was the Royal Commission to consider the extension of the 1870 Education Act, which established compulsory schooling for children ages 5 to 12, but did not include special provision for blind, deaf, epileptic, or physically disabled children, therefore allowing many school boards to refuse to include them with compulsory education. The resulting report from the commission led to the, led to the Elementary Education Blind and Deaf Act being passed in 1893 to provide every blind, deaf, and disabled child the right to education paid by local rates and parliamentary grants. By 1907, the costs were covered entirely by taxpayers. Now, such state and bureaucratic control also began to give greater authority to all practitioners and set guidelines for the education department to incorporate extensive medical policies and to assess, and where possible, even treat disabled children. It meant that deafness was also formally classified as a medical condition requiring certification from a medical practitioner. 
Yet the issue of hereditary diabetes then appeared resistant to this effort, and as I'll show next, involved greater alliances between educators and artists to address the worrying potential of what became known as, quote, a deaf variety. The slide says, tracking intermarriage. One concern raised by the Royal Commission was the issue of hereditary deaf mutism that arise from intermarry and congenitous marriages, so marriages between cousins. As outlined by the Census and Statistical Studies of Deaf Family, they especially place stock on the increasing hereditary transmission of deaf mutism as being evidence for the importance of oralism in teaching through speech. In other words, the concern was if deaf new children with hereditary deafness were left to their own guises at predominantly signing school, then they were more likely to form a community of like-minded signers who were unwilling, if not incapable, to assimilate to the broader hearing society. The situation in the United States was especially revealing for comparison as outlined in the World Commission report. And the quote is also on the screen. Quote, it is said that before education was imparted to deaf mutes and before they were congregated in various educational institutions, hardly any intermarriage. In Germany, Switzerland, and Italy, where oralism dominated, the incidence of deaf intermarriage was much lower than in the United States or England. Although educators at deaf institutions had previously tabulated the incidence of deaf intermarriage, the proliferation of eugenics raised additional fears about heredity, reproduction, and degeneracy. Tabulating data on the existence of large families of deafness or tracing how deafness runs in the family were maintained by individuals in deaf school who tracked the incidence of hereditary deafness. <coughs> the London Asylum for the Deaf and Dumb, for instance, published in 1859 a list of 23 poor and working class families. Of the 160 children among this family, 105 were deaf. The screen shows a photograph of Alexander Graham Bell's memoir. Next to the photo is a text saying a deaf variety and summarizing the details I will be speaking. To read through these varying statistics on hereditary deaf mutism, the Royal Commissioners principally drew testimony from Alexander Graham Bell. Earlier, in 1883, at a meeting of the National Academy of Sciences, Bell raised the issue of the fact that in this country, deaf mutes marry deaf mutes. His resulting publication, Memoir Upon the Formulation, of a deaf variety of the human race, which combined empirical data from American residential schools for the deaf with statistics and probability, worryingly concluded that a deaf variety was becoming increasingly possible and there was no sign of this trend slowing down. Bell's alarmist perspective thereby advocated for eugenics control through all of them by restricting the segregation of deaf people and encouraging them to socialize in hearing community. Any formal restriction or legal ban on deaf intermarriage, he added, would merely promote immoral behavior and possibly even increase rates of hereditary deafness. But preventive measures were recommended as most likely to succeed. Prevention was especially successful when disguised as education reform. 
eliminate was the dental school, forbid sign language use in the classroom, and prohibit deaf adults from becoming teachers for deaf children. These reforms would encourage deaf people to focus on developing their oral skill and make them figuratively less deaf. And these perspectives led Bell's memoir to becoming an often cited source on deaf history. But it also drew the wrath of deaf people who considered Bell's eugenicist view as damning to their community. Bell's view was summarized and repeated in newspapers, magazines, and speeches worldwide. Considered cutting-edge research at the time, his memoir drew inspiration from Francis Galton's statistical imperialism and viewed deaf people as an ideal example to study how continuous selection influenced evolution. While this scientific stand was not new to those who work with deaf people, Bell's reputation drew wider public attention to the topic of hereditary deafness, especially his worrying statistic that 95% of deaf people can intermarry other deaf people. The commissioner professed that Bell's, Bell's studies and supporting research was, quote, sufficient evidence to prove that there is a real danger of an increase of conditional deafness. And they recommended that intermarriages of conditional deaf mute should be strongly discouraged. Now this, this, excuse me, this resolution also demonstrates how the issue of deaf intermarriage reflected changing ideals about expectation for deaf people to assimilate into society and the cost that taxpayers and state aid would require to cover. So for example, one pamphlet showed from, from the London County Council demonstrating the comparative cost. On the screen, we can see this comparison. A normal child, the cost of education would be a little over five pounds. A deaf child, 31 pounds. A child declared as mentally deficient, seven pounds. And one who is physically deficient, 11 pounds. Now the deaf child suddenly cost the most. Further reports from the London County Council indicated that the cost of educating a deaf new child amounted to approximately 31 pounds per year compared to five pounds spent on a normal trial. If the numbers of deaf children continue to increase, especially hereditary deafness tracked to deaf intermarriage, then as one eugenics textbook asserted, quote, Deaf mutism is therefore a very expensive condition for any community to maintain, even if the children, when educated, were able to support themselves. Not all experts agreed that the threat of hereditary deaf mutism was as deeply concerning as the oralists claimed to be. Arthur Henry Bader, the Secretary of the Royal Association in aid of the deaf and dumb, and one of the two deaf signers who were invited to testify for the Royal Commission, strongly opposed Alexander Graham Bell's finding and prescription, as did American educator Edward Minor Gallaudet. Moreover, while Bell tied the prevention of deaf intermarriage to the health of the nature, Statistics provided by deaf people, skeptical educators, and missionaries questioned Bell's evidence and showed that deaf intermarriage only infrequently led to deaf mute offspring. The text on the screen says prevention and control. <coughs> Meanwhile, for autologists, the discourse offered ample opportunities to illustrate the importance of the field for guiding social and educational policy to advise on the issue of, deaf, of hereditary deafness. 
The text on the screen says, Autology is bold, in-depth educator, and is summarizing the points I am speaking. Autology's role became more profound after the 1893 Elementary Education Act and its later provision, which compelled school boards to provide for blind, deaf, epileptic, and disabled children. Now, medical experts controlled the selection process, examining and certifying children who were referred to special schools or classes, thereby positioning medical surveillance as a quasi-eugenicist approach for managing disability in state-funded provisions for education. Autologists assessed children's hearing, diagnosed their deafness, and where possible, recommended surgical intervention to correct hearing defect before a child could be admitted to school. And they especially looked for symptoms of hereditary deaf nudista to discontinuous intermarriage. Many autologists agree that early recognition, prevention, and treatment of all affliction were essential for identifying causes of deafness for intervention. Some, however, took more extreme views when it came to hereditary deafness. One of the most outspoken autologists on the issue of preventing hereditary deafness was Percival McLeod Yersley. In his role as the first senior all soldier and medical inspector to the London County Council School, McLeod Yersley had ample opportunity to judge the working system of deaf education, and he opinioned that, quote, the whole system of deaf education in this country needs thorough reorganization. On the screen is a table of the London County Council School Classification System for Deafness as outlined by Percival McLeod Yersley, corresponding with the educational treatment required. Yersley's view were concerning because the 1893 Elementary Education Act fixed the starting age for deaf school children at seven years of age, in contrast to an ordinary child being set at five. Then he believed that this curtailed any opportunities for early medical intervention and proper assessment of a child's hearing and mental abilities. The results then, McLeod Yersley argued, meant that too many deaf children were being placed in deaf school when they could otherwise benefit from oral classes to obtain speech and make use of their the residual hearing. Even though, even though the causative factors of acquired and continual deafness were recognized and understood by autologists, McLeod Jersey argued that too much emphasis was being placed on cure and not enough on prevention. As he elaborated, for many cases of deafness, a cure was usually hopeless. Under McLeod Jersey's system, all children in the London County Council school, uh, London County Council School had the hearing preliminary examined during the first year by a school doctor or nurse under his supervision. All children who were preliminary diagnosed or suspected of deafness were then recommended to a local autologist. Upon assessment, a child would be classified into three primary groups the very deaf, the semi-deaf, and the slightly deaf, which was later, later further divided into hard of hearing, and then adequately recommended for treatment. Under your, McLeod Yersley's method, the dual process of what he called efficient education and efficient treatment would detect a considerable number of cases of early deafness and could therefore According to him, this diminish the cases of acquired deaf news and those of deaf children who need special education. By no means 
was McLeod Dursley diminishing the value of special education. Also, he was very clear on his position on oil sum, as quoted on the slide. Hearing is the most important educational sense because it channels through which the child obtains the speech and language, which he cannot think and reason clearly. McLeod Jersey claimed that the medical failure to properly assess deaf and deaf mute children, the logical and psychological abilities for language and speech also led to increased unnecessary costs. Quote, Recent statistics show that the cost of education per head of the deaf mute in the London County Council School is £31 per annum. This includes both residential and day scholars. If we deduct the former, the cost is £23. The expense of educating the normal child in the elementary school is £5 that we are paying no less than £18 per annum extra for the education of one section of our defective children. This is an appeal to the pocket which should have some effect upon the rate payer." End quote. Deaf education, he argued, could only be improved through different aspects, medical, hygienic, physiological, social, eugenic, and financial. He argued that the present system could be remodeled, otherwise the system of deaf education would be a complete failure because too many children were not obtaining the benefit of speech. Mick Leo Jersley's research of deaf children at London County School further indicated that too many children were being diagnosed with hereditary deafness. And he advocated for the application of eugenic principle to diminish the rate of deaf mute marriages. His eugenic stance was abundantly clear. Quote, there is another important suggestion which would do much to eliminate the conditional deaf mute. It is sterilization. Every conditional deaf mute should be sterilized. I'm afraid the statement is a bold one, but I do not fear to say it here. Science has, functionally for eugenic, made sterilization possible with a minimum of danger. Now, far from being an outlier, McLeod Jersley stand with an extension of his colleague's view, for he argued that any treatment or study of the deaf child required cooperation between the eugenicist, the hygienicist, the autologist, and the legislator. Moreover, he added that where surgery failed or training and, if necessary, sterilization was required to reduce the incidence of deaf marriages, so the incidence of deafness in future generation. As he declared, quote, where deaf mutism did not pre exist, intermarriage were not created. The slide on the screen shows a group of deaf children in a classroom looking at the camera. The overlay text says, conclusion. What is this history of statistical study, broadly speaking, and concerns about hereditary deafness tell us then? For one thing, it underscores how eugenics has deeply informed much of modern medicine and deaf education. The data that was compiled by artists and educators presented a somewhat worrisome picture of what could occur if deafness, especially hereditary deafness, was not adequately managed. A deaf variety would emerge, social programs would be drained, and taxpayer would bear a greater burden from financing deaf education. Secondly, despite the rich history of sign language, deaf community, and deaf culture, this history shows how deafness is perceived primarily as a medical problem that requires a fix. And thus, the increasing inequities and barriers deaf people face and continue to face 
are further complicated by the fact that this eugenicist agenda of eliminating Daphne, or at the very least, preventing a deaf variety of bell culture, remains an ultimate goal for medical science. Yet far from being the sinister dystopian scenario led by ambitious and callous scientists, these eugenicist perspectives are so truly embedded in society that the future potential of a Daphne's cure is regularly celebrated as a triumph of science, even though the more implications remain debatable concerns. Thank you. So thank you so much, Professor Beardy. Um, it, your lecture was brilliant, and as a historian of, of both eugenics and also uh, contemporary science and medicine, particularly the Human Genome Project, gave me so much to think about. Um, so audience members, we, we look forward to your questions in the Q&A. And I'm also joined by, by Mike Rembus, who is the Director for Disability Studies, the Center for Disability Studies at the University at Buffalo. And I have so many questions for you, Professor Beardy, but I, would, I thought I would let uh, Mike uh, lead off if, if he would like, because I think he has a very, very good question for you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chris. And thank you, Japrit, for your presentation, it was was very enlightening, very interesting. I think the the connections um, with and kind of parallels to the United States and also the international focus, you know, that you're taking is really, really interesting and compelling. Um, I am wondering uh, about the um, ability to study deaf people themselves uh, in this history, which of course, you know, is a priority for disability um, historians. I mean, I think the connections with eugenics and educators and policymakers is really fascinating and interesting and important. And I'm wondering if you could speak either about the methodological, um, you know, constraints and limitations on, um, you know, doing a, a disability history that incorporates the voices and, and experiences of disabled people themselves, um, you know, either speak to that issue or or actually um, talk about how you're thinking about incorporating um, deaf people into into your study. Yeah, thank you. Um, good seeing you by the way. Um, but one of the one of the tenets um this doing research in disability history, as you know, um, and for our audience, is to center the lived experiences of disabled people. That is very challenging to do when so much of the archival work casts these experiences through medical, able, eugenics perspective. So we don't really get a real sense of what deaf and disabled people were actually thinking about the medical eugenic prescription that were leveled against them. And when I first started working on this project, Medicalizing Deafness, it was really just about that, about how deafness came to be medicalized. And what kind of implication would that have on not just education but also our uh, understanding of deafness and just collectively as a society uh, as well as the prescriptions that were provided to medical and surgical valor but i'm very interested in viewing how either deaf people were part of this medicalizing aspect or they resisted against that and this is, I'm still working on this part, like I'm still looking for deaf history from deaf people, by deaf people in the archive. And it is proving to be very challenging. Um, in one sense, because if we look at the history of deaf people, specifically deaf people who communicate with sign language, it's a, it's a very visual language. So it's not something that's captured on texts that are maintained in 19th century archives. So I really kind of have to read against the grain in some way. So this is still an incomplete project, the, the, you know, the top-down history is done, but I want to bring the lived experience of the deafness here and plan to go back to the archive to kind of um, look for that. But it also begs the broader question about the kind of history we keep in the archive. 
my real concern when the world school for deaf children was closing down was I feel bad for the children who lose all the education, but I was also thinking as a historian, but what's going to happen to this archive that I spent over five years trying to access? So now they've been kept and they're in the um, Kent Council, um, maintained at a historical society. So I'm planning to go back, but what I learned also, the majority of the material there are 20th century. The school was founded in 1792, so the records between then and the late 19th or 20th century have been lost or damaged or are very fragmented. So I think it brings even more questions about the kind of history we value to keep. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mike, do you have a, a follow up? Otherwise, I can I can ask my my rather broad question <laughs> to, to, to continue this really fascinating and I think deeply moving discussion. Yeah, no, um, you, you go ahead, Chris. OK, I, I should also say, uh, Mr. Professor Verdi, that as an archivist myself, this is a this is a question that I'm constantly trying to think about, particularly in the context of contemporary science and, and technology and, and really thinking about how are we missing disabled voices? How can we capture them? How can we give disabled voices actors and agency, particularly in the context of mm -hmm. contemporary science and medicine, when those perspectives are still so complex and we don't have intervening years in many ways that uh, do their own kind of interpretation. Time is a kind of interpretation in many ways uh, because it allows, it gives us a certain kind of distance, but it also imposes a certain, certain elements that we, we can only recover certain things. Um, so I'm deeply interested in this question. My follow-up question is, we have, uh, as a historian of both contemporary science and medicine and eugenics, I'm always wondering, how do we think about contemporary science and medicine, like precision medicine, uh, genomics, which for many individuals, particularly in rare disease communities, cancer, uh, where there are clear examples where interventions in modern science really helps people, but it's so entwined with eugenics. Mm -hmm. Statistics as a science is so entwined with eugenics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do we parse out um, sort of the this intertwining? How do we talk about the history of these sciences in an informed way, mm -hmm. looking at the grievous harms, looking at the benefits, and really thinking about the complexities of these issues, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's a, that's a great broad question. Uh, one of the I think one of the messages I outlined in my first book, Hearing Happiness, was that people always have options to select what kind of cure they want for themselves. The issue, for me at least, not the issue, the problem, is when these solutions are presented as the only option, and therefore they get the very specific way of being. So, in other words, deafness is an auditory variation. It's a spectrum that ranges from hearing to complete deafness. And between that spectrum, people have, you know, varied ways of communication, of developing the identity, of deciding what kind of medical prescription they want for themselves. But when we look at this idea of medical science and genomics as the ultimate solution, and one day we're going to find this genetic treatment that can eliminate all kinds of growing diseases. I think if people want that, like if they're really worried about a deliberating, disabling hereditary disease um, that put themselves at risk, um, I think they want that option. It should be given to them. But when we eliminate choice, I think that's when the more quandary is raised. So I'm thinking of like newborn hearing testing. Um, which is done, I don't know, what, for two days, three days, when a child is born. And the, the concern after, you know, you do the newborn test and the screening shows the child has hearing loss or the child has deafness. When that reading is presented to the parent, 
um, or the mother. It is always medical eye. It's always, okay, here's what we're gonna do to fix that. Here is another medical eye, but here is an autologer. But it's very rare that amongst this conversation, there is a representative of the deaf community there. Um, it's very, very rare to do that. So the, most deaf children are born to hearing parents. The hearing parents are not always well versed in sign language or the deaf community. So without that option to raise a child deaf, if they wanted to, the only solution they are presented is the medical one. So I think your, your question also brings to fore how we think about the value of these tools for a society. Do we want a society for a variation? Or do we want everybody to kind of be funneled through the eugenic impulse of what we consider or what we define as a normal citizen? No, I think that's a, a, an incredibly important answer and actually it anticipated the audience question. So thank you very much. This also gives me pause to say that I think there's a lot of ethics, bioethics coming around, uh, coming out right now, which tries to address, um, for example, enhancement sort of, you know, sort of gene therapy for disability and really pushing to the idea that if disabilities are positive things as we view them, as society views them, then there should be that kind of that kind of enhancement as well. That that is enhancement, and I think these are very interesting questions about how medicine routinely normalizes the body and how we are in these frameworks uh, that are very much uh, routinized and and uh, not really not really thought of in ways that I think are critical. And so. So thank you so much for your for your discussion, uh, Mike. Do you have a another Do you have another question as a follow up to mine? Uh, I do have a question. It's not so much a follow up, but it's I think perhaps related. It's more of a historical question about eugenics. Eugenicists played a pretty prominent role in your presentation, and I think the kind of characterization of Britain uh, among you historians of eugenics is that um, they were slightly more reluctant to engage in so-called negative eugenics. You know, they weren't kind of as um, as wedded to um, things like, you know, marriage restrictions, immigration restrictions, sterilization, institutionalization, as say the United States and Germany. Um, and, and, but eugenicists seem to play a really prominent role in your talk today. And so I'm just, I'm wondering if you can elaborate and say a little bit more about, um, you know, what the effects were on the deaf community, whether eugenicists um, were um, able to kind of, you know, uh, implement some of the plans that they were considering and talking about, and just speak more to the to the role of eugenics in um, deaf education and the lives of deaf people in the UK. Yeah, I mean, the idea of eugenics um, in the British context of deaf education was largely about preventing deaf intermarriages. It's between people who were identified as having hereditary deafness. And this was as easy as just doing a family history, like uh, which deaf schools were kind of doing for pretty much the entire 19th century. They were just tracing the rate of generational deafness and keeping track of that data. Um, so basically like family charts. And the recommendation from many autologists, educators, etc., was that if you have been identified as a member of a family that had generational deafness, then you should be prevented, um, mostly through encouragement, like encouraging you not to marry another deaf person, especially one with hereditary deafness. So yes, it wasn't as it wasn't really a sort of negative eugenics that we see um, in other countries. And first of all, McLean Nursley was an outlier. Like not a, there wasn't a lot of push for sterilization in the late 19th, early 20th century, mostly because I would argue that the institutional basis for that wasn't as implemented in place as, in, as with um, other disabilities because Sterilization was happening with people who had mental disabilities or rates of physical disability. I'm still, to be honest, unpacking 
good how prevailing negative vegan was, if at all, within this history beyond Portable McLeary, McLeary. Um, but he also presented his negative eugenic as a, like in a positive spin. Like if we do this, the taxpayers won't have to, you know, pay so much for deaf education. Um, he presented it as part of the necessity for medical civilians at that school. So for him, it wasn't a separate sinister thing. It was part of the medical prevention program that he was already creating for deaf school. Thanks, so, thank you. So no, that was fantastic response. Um, one question I had just to end, unfortunately, because we're about at time is, I was noticing in your presentation, a lot of discussion of class. And I'm just thinking, was, was deafness and, and disability in this context uh, racialized in any way in Britain? Because this is actually the case in Eastern Europe, for example, or what's known sort of broadly as Eastern Europe around the same time where individuals with certain hereditary conditions are explicitly racialized. And I was wondering if you saw any um, any any dynamics between class and race and racialization, even if it is implicit. So, sorry for the scholarly question at the very end. <laughs> I just had to ask. That's okay. Um, class definitely. So even some deaf schools high class, like their class are divided by members of the working class and more privileged students. Race, I don't know yet. I am currently researching that because um, I think it does bring an important dimension to this history. But at this point of my research, I don't know. I should also mention it's the first time I'm presenting his research. <laughs> okay, so unfortunately we are we are a little bit over time, so I have to end this really rich and impactful discussion. So thank you, Professor Verdi. Thank you to, to Mike. Thank you to our audience and our interpreters and our captioners. We are going to be on on break for the next 30 minutes and we will return at 11.30. Thank you very much. See you then.